All right, I was told to wait for the green light. I'm like, how do you expect me to remember a green light with everything going on inside of my head right now? Um, so I, my name is Mark Mashburn, as she said, and I'm, uh, I'm excited and terrified to be here to share with you guys today, to be honest with you. I don't know if you've ever stood in front of an audience of people that just looking at you expecting something, and uh, they're just like, what do you got for us? Come on, I got stuff to do today, boss. Let's go, right? And so that's, that's how I feel standing up here. And so if you could just look at your neighbor and stare at them awkwardly for a few seconds, uh, that would make me feel better so you know how I feel um, being up here. Uh, the thing is, is I, I was a professional football player, and so one of the things that Coach has taught us from, the, from our youth was that if you can get through the first five minutes of any half, you can play the game. Because the first five minutes is filled with lots of nerves, lots of anxiousness, lots of like anticipation, and you can make a lot of mistakes, or you can capitalize on big plays in that first five minutes, and it sets the course and the tone for the rest of the game. And so I'm not going to be up here speaking about football by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I am going to get through this first five minutes so that we can kind of take off here. But before I do that, I'd like to begin with prayer because I want to I want to personally invite the Lord in to to speak through me and to speak to you and to prepare your hearts and your minds uh, because it's absolutely not going to go well if it's just me up here because I know me and uh, if we know him and I know him, then he can actually speak through me and he can speak to you and to your heart. And it won't be about the words that I say. It'll be about the whisper that comes after the words that I say. It'll be about that revelation, that rhema word that he gives you in season for you. And I think a lot of people come to church looking for the word that the person says. They look for the words, and I think you should listen for the whisper. And that's why you even have something to take notes with, so that you can write down that whisper, and you can go back and you can remember what the Lord spoke to you in the season and the moment that you needed it. And that's the seed that you need to keep that you take today. That's the seed that's contained in the word, is the seed that's specific to you in your future. So I'm going to talk about what the Lord put on my heart today. And to be honest with you, I had three sermons written for today. I even sent Raul two of the three. I'm like, here, dude, I give up. Here, just take them. Pick one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but the Lord had put something specifically on my heart, and uh, I tried to run from it a little bit inside. I wrestled. I struggled. My wife's like, dude, just relax. I'm like, I can't. Do you understand the responsibility of influence and the power of this microphone to project your voice into the lives of people? And so I'm going to do the best I can today, and uh, this is called me cutting teeth, right? I'm teething up here in the, in the pulpit. This is uh, the first time I get a chance to share with you guys here today. So um, if you'll just bow your heads in prayer with me, I'm going to invite the Lord in, and then we're going to take off. We're going to go here. You ready? All right. Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we just give you thanks for the opportunity to preach your word, to speak your word, to proclaim your word, to declare your word this morning. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit fill this place with your presence and with your power, and may the water that went forth through the praise and worship soften the hearts and the minds of these people, that they be fertile soil for the seeds that you sow to be planted deep, and the roots may begin to take root and grow. Lord, I praise you and I thank you, and I bind any and all demonic forces and negative influences that would deem to impede today's process, to impede the hearers, the receivers, and the deliverer. Lord, I praise you and I thank you, and I ask you to think through my thoughts and speak through these lips of clay, and I declare that I will be unhindered and unchecked by any outside force, and I thank you and I praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, I'm getting excited. Once I do that, it's ready to go. It's game time. All right, so... Here's what I can do. I can be me. And God designed me and created me and stitched me together in my mommy's womb just like he did you. And when you go out of here, you got to be you with his word inside of you. And when I stand up here, I still got to be me with his word inside of me and all that is within me, right? And so today I'm going to be me. And what I have been in my family in my life is I've been a David. How many people know about David and his story? Everybody. I mean, everybody know about David, right? Everybody knows that from his youth, he was this ruddy good-looking, um, handsome, strapping, undersized young man that was very humble, and he was willing to put his hand to work in his father's house. He was humble. He was respectful. He was honoring. He was submitted. But as he was growing up in the fields with the sheep, he was the least, right? He had brothers that were in the powerful Israelite army where they were going forth, and they were destroying all the works of the enemy, and they were taking ground for the kingdom, and they were establishing Jerusalem and Israel all over the places that God sent them to, and David was in the fields. But what he was doing in the fields is he was being trained for his calling. He was being trained for his purpose, and so while he was in the fields, I believe he was building a relationship with the Father through his experiences, 
And I think the people that were out and they were going forth, they were beginning to rely too much on their own strength and their own power, their own training and their own worldly value system. They were, they were beginning to rely too much on their ability to fight the enemy in their armor. They were relying way too much on themselves and they had forgotten what God had done for them. They'd forgotten what he'd taken them through. And this is a constant theme of mankind. We constantly forget the faithfulness of God, right? We constantly forget what he's brought us through. You know, I stand up here today so grateful. I'm up there before this thing started, and I'm just losing it. I'm like, man, what's going on today, Lord? Like, I don't, I'm not much of a crier. I'm not much of a tearjerker. But when you come upon me, I can't help it but release my tears because I know who I used to be. I know where I was. I know what you've brought me through. I know who, how I used to think. I know what I would have been doing on a Sunday morning 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I know it wouldn't have been this. I know I would have never been asked for the opportunity to influence the lives of your people. And if I was asked this, then I was created for such a time as this. And I was created to be a David in my family, in my house. How many people are tired of looking at their family and looking at the generations and not seeing evidence of the kingdom of God? How many people are sick and tired of their life not lining up with the truth? See, that's what I'm here to talk about today is a strategy of a shepherd boy to bring in a divine presence to overtake the giants that are in the way of your family living in the kingdom with peace. We're going to talk today about destroying and slaying generational giants. Elements of a shepherd boy's divine strategy. I looked at pieces of this story, and there were pieces that kind of popped out to me, and I believe that was an illumination of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've heard this stuff before. Maybe you haven't, but I'm going to share it from the perspective that I was given, and I'm going to give it everything I've got because this is all I've got is right now in this moment today. I've got you one time, and I'm going to do the best I can. So I'm going to talk about the story of David and Goliath, and I don't know that... When I say David, like I'm going to be the king and I'm going to have all the stuff that he had. Hopefully I don't make some of the mistakes that he made, but you know what? We all make them anyways, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you the story and I'm going to set the stage. I just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective if you never heard about David before, that he was the least. He was the youngest. He was the last. He was the smallest. He was insignificant in the eyes of his house. Yet if it wasn't for him, all of Israel would have fallen. So here's the setting. The Philistines gathered. I'm going to read straight out of the Bible. I have a Bible app over here, and then Raul has some scriptures that you guys will be able to partake in just reading this story in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is the reference point. Reading that whole story from the screen would take way too long. For me, I'm heavy scripture. I know if I don't have a lot of scriptures, there's a lot of Mark, and if there's a lot of Mark, there's less Jesus. And so I'm just going to do all scripture, heavy scripture. I'm going to ad lib a little bit here, but let's set the stage real quick. The Israelites had set up on top of a hilltop in the Valley of Elah. By the way, Elah is actually translated to tree. And in Isaiah, we were called to be oaks of righteousness. That doesn't necessarily mean they were operating in their identity. They were sitting in the valley that was supposed to tell them who they were. They were trees with deep roots, and they were strong and powerful. They were mighty, and they were supposed to be established for years and years and years. Yet they had forgotten their identity. So they're sitting on this valley. They're sitting in this valley, and they put themselves up on a mountaintop, and the Philistine army is on the other side, impeding their journey. And the Philistine army had coming from the ranks a champion. They call him a champion, which I know who my champion is. Right, but they had a champion. His name was Goliath. And Goliath comes down and he starts standing in the middle of this valley and he proclaims to the Israelite army. Now, mind you, Goliath, we know Goliath and we just think big. But I'm 5'10". That's not big at all, unless you're my son who's like three feet tall, right? Dad, you're big. I'm like, wait till you get as big as me, buddy. You won't think that anymore. And then we're going to have another conversation. <laughs> but Goliath was 10 feet tall. Can you imagine a human being 10 feet tall? I mean, we see like Shaq or if you're from my generation, like Mutombo or some of these guys in basketball. And I mean, Orlando stands up and he's a giant in this entire house, right? He's six feet, four inches tall. And you're like, can you like sit down so we can have a conversation so I don't have to go to the chiropractor or Kaylee again? You know what I mean? Like the, she's making a lot of money every time I look up at Orlando and have a conversation. I'm like, can you fix my neck? I was looking at Orlando for 10 minutes yesterday, right? But you got these, this giant that was four feet taller than him. And he was wearing a, 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 a coat of armor that weighed 5,000 shekels. And I was going to look that up, but I'm like, who cares? All it was, it was heavy, and only he could carry it. Only he could carry the weight of the world at that point in time. Because that was what his power was in, was being able to carry the weight of the world. Why did God put how big his coat of armor was? Why did he put how big his sword? He had a spear that was like 600 shekels at the front of the spear. The thing was super, like if David would have carried it, 
he probably would have had to get a donkey to carry that thing, you know what I mean? Like, tied it on the donkey's back, and it would have drug way behind him. This guy was gargantic. He was gigantic, and his voice was booming, and where he stood in the valley, I believe that it projected louder. I mean, they've talked about places where Jesus preached in that same area, that he would sit in a certain place, and his voice would carry for thousands of people. He knew the exact pinpoint. I believe Goliath was standing in a similar place, and he was proclaiming to the Israelite army, send me a man so I can destroy him. He had so much confidence in his own ability and his own power, and he was standing there saying, send me a man. All this whole army, y'all are a bunch of punks. Send me one. I'm going to kill him. And when I kill him, y'all will be my slaves. Why didn't the whole army charge that guy? I, can, I constantly sit here and go, it's thousands of men. Like David went to feed the commander cheese of a thousand men. That was one commander of a thousand men. There were multiple commanders and multiple thousands of men, and there was one giant. And all of these people had forgotten that God was with them. One man with God is the majority, not the minority. This was one man versus one man with God. There were thousands of men sitting there. So the champion came out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. They talk about his size and all that stuff. That's fantastic. Talks about the shaft, the shield bearer. He had a shield bearer in front of him. Like he had a human being that was his shield. If he was such a BA, why did he have a shield bearer? It looks like he was a little bit scared, too. Except for he projected his arrogance because he knew it would terrify the people that were listening. He said, why have you come out to draw battle? Am I not the Philistine? And are you not all servants of Saul? Point this out. He didn't say servants of the Lord. He said servants of Saul. So he redirected their mindset to the person who was in authority. Aren't you guys all servants of the president of the United States? Why you bow to all of the policies that are happening, by all these things that are ungodly, by all these principles, by all this stuff that's happening, while we bow as believers when we're supposed to remember who we are and whose we are? I think it's similar times today as the giant stands in front of us and tells us that we're servants of him. Aren't you servants of your king? Who are you to stand against me? I'm the champion. You guys are servants of this little man. Choose a man for yourself and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. I mean, who is this guy? What makes him think he's going to dictate to us how we're going to fight the war? That's not the way rules go. He doesn't even have any authority. He's literally just a giant. He's just a big dude. Because he's a big dude, he thinks he owns everything. Because he's in a po position of power. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the battle lines of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When Saul heard his own name, that they were servants of him, he trembled. Because he knew he had no power. He'd actually already lost his anointing anyways. So let's talk about this little guy in the field. Now David was the son of Epaphrodite of Bethlehem. Ephrathite. Who can read this stuff? You need the Holy Spirit to enunciate some of these words, you know what I mean? Je Jesse was in the old days of Saul and advanced in years among men, so his dad was old. His three older sons had followed Saul into battle. Remember, they didn't follow the Lord into battle. They followed Saul into battle. By the way, Saul was the first king of Israel, and the people are the ones that told God to place him as king, and that was the one thing that God said he regrets in the Bible. God didn't want them to have a king between them. God wanted to be his father, their father. So the names of these two sons went into battle. Eliab, the firstborn, next was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest, now the three oldest sons followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's flock of Bethlehem. The Philistine Goliath came out morning and evening and took his stand for 40 days. You know what he did? He said the same thing, the same narrative. Send somebody, I'm going to kill him. You serve this guy. And he just kept repeating it and repeating it. How many people got CNN on every morning and every night? How many people got Fox on every morning and every night? How many people got the media, the social media, the Instagram, all this garbage? And where is the truth? That's the problem with this generation today is they've got access to too many lies. All the lies have always been there, but they've got access to them. So they hold fast to these lies because they're mixing them with their thoughts, and those are penetrating their thinking. And now subconsciously, in their spirit, they've received the fear that has been projected from the world instead of being the guy that's away from all that garbage, sitting in the field, building a relationship with the Lord. Tested in the, tested in the field. Tested, developed, trained, humble, submitted, 
And we get arrogant because we take on the arrogance of the world when we listen to all their garbage because now we try to rise up in our flesh against the voices. We get mad and start speaking to the Philist- start speaking the same way the Philistine speaks. We become just like the world in an attempt to combat the world because we know in our spirit that is wrong. But it's still in our own power. So Jesse sends his son David. Now mind you, in chapter 16, David was anointed as king. But he didn't take his position as king yet. It wasn't time yet. There was still a king. He was just prophesied of his future. Hey, here's the future place that I have for you. You're going to rule all this. David didn't leave the field to go take over the kingdom. David left the field to go serve his brothers and his king because he was still submitted to his father. He didn't try to do things ahead of its time. So he said, quickly take the stuff to the camp. He took 10 cuts of cheese to the commander unit. See how your brothers are doing and bring back the news of them. As in, hey, Eliab, Abinadab, Shama. How are you guys doing? Dad wants to know. He wasn't there to do anything other than get information and take it back to Dad and drop off some food for them. Hey, you guys are probably hungry out here. Now, the Dad didn't know that there was a giant there. Nobody knew. It's not like they, had, they could flip on you know, Facebook Live and, and Goliath was sitting there like talking through the thing like, hey, I'm here in front of the Israelite army. These guys are a bunch of punks. Look at them. Look at these guys. They're shaking in their armor. I'm one man. I got thousands over here. Look at this guy. That's what we hear all the time. I'm the deal, right? So David got up early in the morning. He didn't waste time. He didn't make haste. He just went. He left the flock with the keeper, and he picked up the provisions and went just as Jesse had directed him, and he came to the encampment as the army was going out in battle formation, shouting the battle cry. They still ran out to shout the battle cry. We're going to fight. Like every day they woke up, and they remembered God's new mercies are new every morning, and they started running, and then Goliath would come out, and they'd go, ah, and they'd turn and run the other way. For 40 days. How, you, how, how long does it take to create a habit? 28 days? 30 days? They have all, it's over 21, I know that, right? 40 days. 40 days they started to build this pattern in their mind of the repeat of Groundhog's Day. I'm going to live the same way every single day of my life. I'm going to go out of my house. I'm going to go out of my camp to fight a battle. As soon as I see the giant, I'm going to get scared, and I'm going to run back to camp. Every single day. They didn't change their process. They didn't change their pattern. They didn't change their thinking. They didn't seek out truth. They just listened to the enemy, and then they started repeating what he said. David left his provisions in the care to the supply keeper and ran into the ranks He ran into his family. He ran into the soldiers, and he came and he greeted his brothers. And as he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine Gath from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words again, and David heard him. When the men of Israel all saw the man, they fled from him, and they were frightened. Can we do this again? You got one giant and thousands of men. I don't, like, me fighting two men is like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, right? I don't care how good of a fighter you are. Fighting two or three men is probably pretty difficult. But when you got thousands in armor with swords and shields and, like, how do you lose? How do you lose? See, because the battle isn't physical. The battle is mental. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. Have you seen the new law that just passed? Have you seen the new policy that just passed? Have you seen the new press conference that this person said this and that person said that? Does that sound familiar? These guys, the Israelites, were not speaking powerful words of God. They were speaking the narrative of the enemy. And they were infiltrating their own camp by agreeing with his words because they were repeating him. And every single one of them were frightened because they'd stolen their own power by speaking the way that the world spoke. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who comes up? Surely he is coming to defy Israel. We can relate. The king will reward the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter in marriage and make his father's house, his family, free from taxes and service from Israel. In essence, the man that that defeats that guy will get the kingdom. Not only will they get the kingdom, the one that defeats the giant, not only will get the kingdom, but he's going to be able to bring his family into the kingdom. They're not going to have any taxes on their life. By the way, you're going to get the bride too. Like this oldest daughter of mine, you're going to become my son-in-law. Look at her. Right? She must have been. I mean, think about David. David's like, look at her, look at the giant. 
Look at her, look at the giant. Let's do this. You know what I mean? That must have been what it had been like. Like, look at her, look at the giant. Like, forget about the taxes. You said taxes? Oh, no, what about the girl? Like, get, look, he's, he's 14, give him a break, you know what I mean? So then David spoke to the men who were standing by him. And he said, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace of his taunting from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God? Do you know David's disposition? He's over here talking to his brothers. He hears this dude yell, and he's like, who the heck is this guy? He looked, he looked at him like, who's this guy I think he is? He's not with God. We are. He doesn't have God with him. Why are we listening to this guy? He didn't repeat what the Philistine said. He looked at him and said, who are you? I ain't scared of you. Hey, what's my reward? What's my reward? Tell me what I get for taking this guy out. I want to find that out first because I'm looking at him and he ain't nothing. I got my daddy with me. I'm not scared like all y'all. I haven't been sitting here 40 days listening to this clown. I've been in the fields talking to my father. I've been tending to the sheep. I've been doing what I'm supposed to do to be prepared for such a time as this. And I'm looking at this giant and he looks small to me because I know how big my God is. So we want to take a look at the divine strategy of a, of, a, of a shepherd boy. The first thing he did was capture a vision for what happened as a reward. See, here's the thing. What is the reward is essentially capturing a vision of the reward of victory. So we got six steps to slaying these giants of generational curses. The first step is you got to capture a vision for what you want your family to look like. You got to capture a vision for the, the other side of the giant that's in the way of your guys' family and your future. It could be inside your house, it could be your extended family. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what doesn't look like the kingdom? Examine your life and look at what doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like if you're a child of the Most High God. And if it doesn't look like that, then there's a giant that's in the way of you getting to the promised land, and you better identify that giant. But first things first, you need a vision of what it's like without him. Because if you just identify the giant without the vision, you're going to still focus on the giant and not the vision. So you've got to grab a vision of the reward. You've got to grab a vision of the future. You've got to grab a vision of what's next. The first thing we need to do is grab a vision. See, lack of a clear and concise vision is the root cause of distraction, apathy, failure, and frustration. Do any of these adjectives describe your current position? So many people are sitting here living in survival mode, but they got the power of God inside of them to accomplish whatever they were born to accomplish. And so we sit around and we go, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, things aren't working out, money's not this and this. And we just repeat what the world is saying. And all we have to do is grab a vision of what God tells us. The Bible says where there is no vision, no revelation of God in his word in Proverbs 29, 18. The people are unrestrained. They're undisciplined. They have no reason to discipline themselves to the word of God to apply it to their life because they have no direction. There's no picture of where they're going. Does that make sense? And so these Philistines were yelling of their vision and the believers, the children of God, the Israelites were sitting on the mountain and they were receiving this vision of their future. They were living in the fear of slavery, not the promises of freedom. They had forgotten who their God was. And that he was with them. It says, but happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. To keep means to cause to continue in a specified condition, position, or course. To have or retain possession of. How do we have and retain possession of the vision that we want? Well, in Habakkuk 2, 2, and 3, it says, and God answered, write this. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. Why do you see it read on the run? See, if you're spending time cultivating this vision, if you're spending time in the Word, if you're spending time with the Father, if you're spending time learning your identity and who you are and where you're going, you can be moving and remember the vision. You don't need to stop your assignment to go back and dig it up. You've written it down in big, bold letters. You've got it ingrained inside of you. You know where you're going. You know why you're going there. You know where you're headed. And so he says, write it down and make it plain in big letters so that you can run. This vision, the message, is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait, and it doesn't lie. 
If it seems slow in coming, wait, it's on its way. It will come on the right time. See what had happened to the Israelites by day 30 and 31 and 32. There was nobody that rose up. There was nobody that rose up among the ranks and came out and said, I'll take this dude on. Nobody's belief changed. Nobody's mindset changed. So there was a delay in the victory. There was also a delay in the battle. They wouldn't even engage or move forward. They were just stuck. How many people are stuck? The stuck is a choice. The stuck is I lost my vision. I don't know what I'm trying to accomplish with my life. I don't know what I want to improve my life. It doesn't necessarily mean you're building something, even though Pastor talked about building, that we're builders. We are called to be builders. But what about building your family on the rock? What about building your family on the word of God? Isn't that priority? I mean, you cannot get the word of God inside of you and not have it push you or pull you to where you're supposed to be. There's a level of discomfort that happens when you know what's inside of you and you're not working towards it. That's the vision that people lose. That's step one. Get the vision. So let's keep moving on. The men told him, after he said, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he taunted and defied the armies of the living God? The men told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now, here's the thing. Anybody ever heard of border bullies? Soon as David captured his vision, somebody from his family came to take it away. Check this out. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard what he said to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. You want to know what his vision did? It exposed Eliab of his cowardice. Why didn't the oldest? Remember, Eliab's the firstborn brother, the inheritor of the estate. Why was he not the one that stepped up to the Philistine? The younger little brother is the one that had the faith. The older brother was like everybody else in fear and trembling. So his anger burned against David. Why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Hey, remember, David, you got this dinky little responsibility, but we're sitting here fighting these battles. Don't you remember that I'm part of Israelite's army? Don't you know how prestigious we are? Don't you know what you do? Don't you know who you are in your place? You're supposed to go herd a couple of sheep. Go back to your job. Go back to your cubicle. Go back to your desk. Silence. Trust me. I've got your best interests at heart. How many people have said stuff like that to us? He said, I know your presumption, your overconfidence, and your evil of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not a harmless question? He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause in today's society and generations to be the David for our family? Is there not a cause worth putting away old things and stepping into new things? Is there not a cause? Is our family's salvation not a cause? Is our family's deliverance not a cause? Is there not a cause? But see, the cause was the vision. And the cause was, this dude is in the way. And I'm taking him out. I got my vision. I'm getting that girl. I'm getting that kingdom. Oh, and by the way, daddy, you don't have to pay taxes no more to the government. I'm taking over. I'm taking over. David turned away from his brother. Here's the key. David turned away from Eliab to someone else and asked the same question. He said, remind me of what the reward is again. Hey, bro, I want you to see this. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Look at my back. What's the reward again? I'm not going to listen to your doubtful words. I'm not going to let you cast this vision over me. I'm not going to let you put me back in my place. I've got a vision, and I want this man to remind me of what the reward is that vision. Maybe you need to go to somebody else than the people that are telling you you can't, that you shouldn't, that you won't. Maybe you need to go to somebody else and you need to ask them, what's the reward of this again? What does God say about this again? What is the truth of the matter again? Maybe you need to find somebody that's going to tell you the direction that you're going and not tell you where you've been or where you need to stay. Then David turned away from Eliab and asked someone else the same question, and the people gave him the same answer as the first time. So step two is identify the giant. He knew the problem was the Philistines. He knew the problem was Goliath, but he also had to ignore the allies of Goliath. And interestingly enough, the allies of the enemy sometimes can be the people in your own camp. 
Sometimes they can be the border bullies that keep you from the destiny that you want to step out to, but you're so afraid of failing at the hand of the giant that's in front of you. That giant's been speaking loud. We call it the chatterbox. Stephen Furtick calls it the chatterbox. Sometimes you got to crash that chatterbox and tell it to shut up. Tell me the vision again. Tell me the vision again. Give me Habakkuk 2-2 again. Write the vision down and make it plain. I know where I'm going. I'm not going to forget. The army, Eliab, and even the king all doubted David's ability and attempted to talk him out of his pursuit of his reward, his vision. All of them attempted to parrot the fear of the giant had persuaded them to believe, and David turned away from the naysayers. He kept his mind on the reward and ushered, that ushered him into the right position where he could plead his case of his cause. He represented a potential solution. He was the only one around with the right attitude and the right mindset. You want to get some Davids in your life, but I think you should become the David in your life. You see, David was willing to take the responsibility that none of these people were willing to take. So all of us are sitting around hoping that something else happens for somebody else and somebody becomes our savior when we need to be the David. If you're the one hearing the word of God, you've got to take it, keep it, and you've got to move forward with it, and you've got to give it to everybody else. When the words that David spoke were heard, the men reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, this is huge. David told the king, let no man's courage fail because of Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight the Philistine. He basically said, take heart, I got this. Don't be scared. Don't be, like, change your position. Believe in the same God that I believe in. Believe that we're going to beat this giant. Come and agree with me. But here we go again. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight him. For you are only a young man, and he has been a warrior since his youth. He's right there. He's got one more step to fight the battle. And the person of authority over the army reminds him of his position. He tries to sit him down. He says, I'm looking at you in the natural. I'm not looking at you in the supernatural. I'm seeing you as you are, and I'm telling you because of what I see with my eyes. Now, mind you, David came out of the field. He had a, 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 a I don't know, a dress on. That's what we call it today, right? He had like a sheet on, right? He had this little belt around his waist, and he had this little sheep's lunch bag, like a little boy lunch bag, right? And he had this staff in his hand. He looked like he didn't belong. He looked like a common sheep herder boy. They're not even in the city square. They're not in the places of business. They're not in the places of authority or leadership or prestigiousness. The shepherds are, are like outside of the village. Most people don't even know them. And they're dirty. They're dirty. So David's there and he says, hey, remember, kid. Hey, it's okay, buddy. I know. It's cute. You, you, have, you have childlike faith. That's good. Go back home. And David said, hold on a minute, Saul. Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock. I went out after it and attacked it and rescued the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I seized it by its whiskers and I struck it and I killed it. I mean, hold up a minute. <laughs> the elements of the world have already come against me. See, number three is remember the faithfulness of God. Watch this. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, since he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God. Hey, when you're against God, he's with me, he ain't with you. Better watch out. I don't need all that other stuff. I just need him. I just need the truth. That's all I need. David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He remembered the faithfulness of God. He said, be strong and courageous. This is Deuteronomy 31, 6. And do not be afraid or tremble in dread before them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. I like to take scriptures from other places in the Bible and confirm what I saw here. I think the reason why God even tells these stories is, is there a prophecy of how we're supposed to live in the future? I think we're supposed to start looking at these stories and not going, this is really cool. That David killed Goliath. It became a secular story. It became a myth, a fairy tale. Come on. We let the world take over this? We let the world take over Noah's Ark? We let the world be the narrative of what's true and we watch it? 
I mean, I don't even watch the Bible stuff on the TV without the Bible in front of me. If it doesn't line up with this, it ain't, mm, I'm out. And my kids aren't getting influenced by it. But some of you guys see the word Bible, not you guys. Some of the people see the word Bible and they just hit play. Who created it? What's the narrative? What's the spirit behind it? Because the devil will show up as an angel of light. It's called deception. It's called the yeast of the Pharisees. All it needs is a little ingredient that's not true for it to be wrong. And as that yeast begins to rise, and when it begins to rise, it permeates the entire loaf, the entire body. We got to get the yeast out. So he remembered his faithfulness. Sometimes people are like, but I, but me, but I. And in 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. You want to know what David's confidence was? God already told me I'm the king. So if I go against the Philistine, I have to win. God is with me. He's already told me what my future is. He's already said it. He's already declared it. He's already prayed it over me. He's already anointed me for it. I know I'm not living in the reality of it, but I know that I'm going to, so this thing can't stand in my way because God has already told me what my destiny is. You want to know how he knew his destiny? Because he had a relationship with the Father in the field. The reason why so many people don't have vision is because they don't know their destiny or they've heard it and they push it down because it scares them. They hear it and they push it down. Listen, if it keeps coming back, it's because it's your destiny. If it keeps coming back, it's because it's part of your assignment. If it keeps coming back, it's probably because it's part of your calling. You probably should get quiet and listen to why you're alive. Because what other reason do we have to live for? And you may be trained or in training right now in whatever field that you're in. But you got to take the lessons of that field and you got to remember the Lord and you got to find out what he is in because it's just preparation for the next season. But if you're continuing around the mountain over and over and over again, it's probably because of the murmuring, and complaining and the whining, just like the Israelites. It's because they've forgotten the faithfulness of God. Then Saul dressed David. Oh, so here's what Saul said. He persuaded the king. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul got jacked. There's an exclamation point right there. I don't think God puts an exclamation point where it ain't exciting. <laughs> Saul was like, go and the Lord be with you. Like, you killed the lion? You killed the bear? I mean, I took thousands of people and took out the Abilamukites or whatever the heck they are, right? And I, and I, and I fell short. I've, I've taken thousands of people into these battles and God was with us. I've seen what God has done before. You reminded me of what's true. I'm excited for you. Let God be with you. I'm agreeing. This little sheep boy persuaded the king by his faith. But it wasn't his faith. It was the faith of God. It was the faith in God. It was the faithfulness of God that he declared to the king that turned the king's heart. And the king said, awesome, man. You go and do this thing. And he probably was like, I'm going to kick back because this kid's going to win. Because he forgot. Remember, the Philistine hasn't spoken in a while. What has been declared? The word of the Lord has been declared. So the word of the Lord takes the place of the voice of the world, and now the king is persuaded. Go ahead, little boy. But before you go, let me, let me put my armor on you. Now think about this. The king takes his personal armor off and puts on this little boy. That's a position of authority that the king has transferred. I think that's symbolic of it. You're about to take over. You are about to take over. But here's the thing. Even though he said the Lord be with him, there was still a little bit of doubt. Because we're called to go into battle with the full armor of God, not the full armor of the world. And the reason why I believe God told us about the armor of Goliath and then the armor of the king of Israel is because the king tried to put his armor on David to have him fight the Israelite like, or the Philistine like the Philistine would fight David. And so David complied and he put it on. And he dressed him in the garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and put a coat of mail of armor on him. And David fastened his sword over his armor and tried to walk, but he could not because he was not used to them. And David said to Saul, I, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So David took them up. I, I can't go the way that you see me going. I got to go the way that God told me. I cannot go being somebody that I'm not. I've got to go with all that I am because all that I am is all that he is and all that he is is all that is in me. I don't have time to go with your armor. Your armor is worthless against that giant. 
The only thing that's going to win this victory is the same Lord that protected me from the bear, the same Lord that protected me from the lion, the same Lord that paid the bills when I didn't think they were going to be paid, the same Lord that healed me of sickness when I was sick, the same Lord that delivered me from drugs when I was on drugs, the same Lord that took me from alcohol when I was on alcohol. It's the same God. And every giant that rises up against me, I'm going to stand against him and remember the faithfulness of God and remember what he's done for me in the past. And I'm going to move in to the battlefield swiftly so that I don't have time to think. Notice how David never repeated what the Philistine said. He never spoke of the world. So when he put down the world's way of doing things and he started approaching the battle, verse 40 says, then he took up his shepherd's staff in his hand. And he chose for himself five smooth stones out of the stream bed and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had. That is, in his shepherd's pouch. With his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. David shed the world's way of approaching the battle and stepped onto the battlefield with confidence and authority. He chose to take responsibility for his family, his countrymen, regardless of their disposition. He decided not to rely on the weapons and protection that man used, but he was determined to use the experiences that the Lord had prepared him through as a sense of encouragement. In other words, he just decided to move forward being himself. And he didn't try to cover himself with anybody else's ideas of victory or success, but he relied on the revelation that it was the Lord who had delivered him and not the tools. Not the strategy, not the way, but the way. He kept his perspective on things above and he kept his confidence in the right place. Here's what this looks like. He later on wrote in Psalms 23, 4, even though I walk through the sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod to protect and your staff to guide me. They comfort me and console me. They give me confidence. They give me courage. They give me strength. So what you have to do when you go into the battle is you have to pick up your staff. You have to pick up the staff to head into the battle. And our staff is the inerrant word of God. It is our responsibility to pick up the book and carry the book within our person. We have to keep it in our hands. The Bible says before they sent the Israelites in the promised land in Joshua 1, 8, and 9. That's not on here. But he said, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not let the words depart from your mouth, but meditate on them day and night. What were the Philistines proclaiming to the Israelites, what were they meditating on day and night? Fear, discouragement, doubt, worry, slavery. Their vision had been destroyed because they listened to the wrong voice. But the Lord says, take your staff, the rod. There's a place in the Bible where the Bible says that the Lord's breath will destroy the evil, will kill the evil. He'll take his rod and he'll proclaim it. So the rod actually happens to be the word of God, the breath of life that he breathed into us. He gave us the staff of leadership. He gave us the staff of responsibility. He gave us the staff of power and of position and of authority. He gave us the staff of peace to comfort us. See, we should be able to go into this battle not scared. We should be able to go in the battle with the peace that passes understanding because we know it's the Lord that wins the battle. And he works in and through us. We know we're all facing some sort of a battle. The Bible says through much trial and tribulation, we should enter into the kingdom of God. He says as long as we're alive, we're going to face persecutions and problems and troubles, especially in these end times. So we've laid down our staff and we've let it get dusty on our nightstand. And then we think we're going to read it and we move it over here to our desk. And we think we're going to read it and we move it over here to our coffee table. And it's just dusty. We dust it off, open it, don't have time for it. I got distracted. I got a notification on my phone. And we put our authority and our leadership and our confidence and our comfort to the side to face the challenges of the day. Yet every time we try to step forward, the giant screams and we run back to camp. So we got to pick up our staff as a responsibility to lead our family. This isn't enough. Listening to somebody else talk about the word of God is not enough. The seeds are planted. Your responsibility is to water them. Your responsibility is to plant new ones. Your responsibility is to build that relationship. You don't want to get depart from me. I never knew you at the end of your life because you didn't build a relationship as a son or a daughter. There are people that have been set apart and called out to preach and proclaim the word of God, but everybody is supposed to know him. He says, if you abide in me, then me and my Father will come and abide in you. And that anything you ask of me in prayer will be done by my Father which is in heaven. 
The reason why we can't come before his throne with confidence is probably because we forgot who his, how his faithfulness is. We haven't picked up our staff and been reminded of what his truth is. So the next thing David did was he chose the stones. He chose the stones to put in his shepherd's bag. Now, the shepherd's bag represents a position of humility, meekness, low position, and a servant. In the Amplified Bible, it calls it like a whole kid's skin. Like it's a little goat. A kid is a goat. It's like a little kid's skin that was just on his hip. It wasn't that big. He probably couldn't fit more than five stones in it. It was literally just for his day's lunch. You know what I mean? He went out to the field. He fed the sheep. He had a couple snacks in there. He was a 14-year-old kid, so he didn't need that much provision. And then he went back home, and he just filled it with his provision. But he had taken the provision out, and he'd given the worldly provision to somebody else, and he took the rocks, and he put them in there. And the rock represents Jesus. By the way, it's number five, which is the number of grace. David put five stones in the bag, and the number to five picks the grace of God, and his grace gives us the revelation of his empowerment. See, without the grace of God, we have no power. We can't walk in that authority because it's by grace we were saved through faith. Charles Capp said it this way, grace is God's willingness to use his power and ability on our behalf, even though we don't deserve it. Paul even wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, and they're always available regardless of the situation. My power is being perfected and is completed, and it shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness, says Paul, so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. In 2 Timothy 2, 1, it says, So you, my son, be strong, constantly strengthened, and empowered in the grace that is to be found only in Christ Jesus. So he picked up his five stones, and they were smooth. Can you imagine trying to sling like a jagged stone? I mean, there's a lot of error that could happen there. He understood that the stones needed to be smooth, that there needed to be no blemish, no spots, no cricks, no breaks. It needed to be a smooth stone. What I recommend is that you go home and you identify your giant and you choose three to five scriptures that pertain to that giant that's in your way. And you begin to train your mind and your heart with those stones. You begin to keep them close to you and meditate on them day and night with you each day. The smooth stones, they're, 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 they're smoothed out. The stones in the brook. Notice how it said in the brook because the water washed over these stones and that's what smoothed them out. And the water dictates the Holy Spirit. So yeah, maybe when you may receive the word of God, it might not be just smooth. You might not have it right there all the time, but you got to continue to wash it with the watering of the word of God. you got to continue to meditate on it day and night so those smooth stones can be ready to sling at the enemy. You can't throw the word of God at your problem if you don't have it. And you got to go to the water to get the stones that are smooth. you got to go to the spirit of God. you got to go to the brook, the word. you got to get it from Jesus. Smooth stones out by watering them with time and prayer and with the Spirit so that when the time is right, you keep them near to your heart. They will keep your attitude in a place of humility and they will fix your confidence on the Lord and not in the giant. They are ready for the sling. The next thing, number six, and the final one is keep your sling in your hand. The sling is the word quela, Q-E-L-A, and it is spelled out kuf, lamed, ayin in the Hebrew. Kuf is a picture of the back of a head and it means behind or last or least. It's a position of humility. See, you had giants that carried spears with big heads. You had people that wore armor, but then you got this little boy that's carrying around humility. He knows that it's not about him or his power. He's carrying around humility. He knows it's not in him. He doesn't have an arrogance. By the way, not receiving truth is also arrogance. Not agreeing with the word of God is also saying, I've got this. And that's when you run into the battlefield, the giant yells, you have nothing to anchor you. And you run back into camp. Lamed is the picture of a staff representing the voice of authority. It's declarative. Having the authority and releasing the authority are two totally different things. The angels hearken under the word of the Lord. He says in Isaiah, I believe, I don't know the scripture, I didn't write it down, but 55 maybe. He says, so be the word that goeth forth out of my mouth, that it may not return to him void, but that it shall accomplish, it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it to, and it will accomplish, <laughs> it shall prosper in the thing where I sent it, and it shall accomplish that which I please. Isaiah 55. Before that it says, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. 
The world's ways, armor and weapons. God's ways, his word, his anointing, his power, his authority. Ayin is the picture of an eye. The picture of the word ayin is an eye. It's vision. It's, it means to know or experience, to see. See, all three of these things are contained in just this, the sling. Kela, quela, whatever, however you say it. There's no use, so I don't know how to say it in English. Kela, kuf, lamed, ayin. It's this, the complete word gives us a complete picture of something that will be used or experienced by someone demonstrating godly authority who is surprisingly the least or the last. God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and it demonstrates a weapon used by an insignificant person who will be given the authority to rescue their family with spiritual power or significance. So if we recap the story, it's pretty much every part of the strategy of David is wrapped up in his sling. At the end of the day, you get all these components of him. You figure out how to get your vision, and you realize the outcome that you want, that you desire for your family. Where do you find the vision? In the Word. What does the Bible say that your life should look like? What is the Word of God? Who does the Word of God say that you are and that what you're capable of? You go find that in the Word. You set that vision, and then you identify the giants. you got to get the vision first so that the giant doesn't scare you, because if you get the giant first, it's going to be pretty hard for you to go grab that vision when you're running from him. Get the vision first. Identify the giant second. Remember the faithfulness of God third. Do not forget what he's brought you through. If you're here, you weren't here before. If you're here, he brought you from somewhere. He specifically came to you to reveal himself to you. None of us could preach or speak good enough for salvation. The Bible says that it is the Spirit of God that reveals the true nature of Christ to us, and that it's our choice and responsibility to receive and accept him. So don't forget God's faithfulness because you know you've had a victory in your life somewhere. You know he's come through at the last moment on something. You know you've had a need that has been met through prayer, especially when you were brand new and you were a baby believer. You know, you prayed and things happened. But he brings us into the field into the place of servitude and humility so that he can train us for our destiny. We got to pick up our staff of authority. We got to read the word of God. We got we to gotta put away all the things of the world. We got to stop listening to the giants that are in our life and pick up that staff. And then we got to meditate on it. We got to choose our stones. We got to pick specific scriptures that pertain to our situation. We've got to search the word of God to find out what we need so that we can begin to, to plan it inside of us. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4 that we don't even know how faith grows that we plant the seed and we go to bed day and night and then first the blade, then the stalk. It grows up into harvest time and when it's harvest time, you put the sickle in and you get the harvest, you get the wheat and you separate it from the shaft. You throw the stone at the giant when your faith is matured. But you never let it depart from your mouth. You keep saying it, you keep saying it, you keep declaring the word of God. You stop the people and the voices of the enemy. You stop the voice of the giant. You don't even acknowledge it. What's the reward again? I'm going to surround myself with people that know the reward. What's the reward again? What's the truth again? Hey, what's the word again? What's the vision again? Hey, tell me where we're going again. What is going I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to you. Come here. What do we got? Sorry, mom. If you don't believe me, that's fine. Sorry, dad. Sorry, brother. Sorry, cousin. Sorry, boss. I ain't listening. It's not going to happen. Thank you for saying what you're saying. But here's what the truth is. The faithfulness of God is real, and he's sending me into a new place. And I'm not going to dishonor you, king. I'm not going to dishonor you, mom. I'm just going to turn away from the information. And I'm going to grab that vision. And I'm going to grab a hold of those stones. And I'm going to keep them close to me. And then we got to get our sling. And we got to sling those swords. The Bible says that, that the Philistine came and approached David with the shield bear in front of him. And the Philistine looked around and saw David. He derided and disparaged him because he was just a young man with a ruddy complexion and a handsome appearance. You're a cute little boy. It's like my son running up here trying to fight me. I look at him I'm like, you're cute. Knock him over. He mocked him. How many of you have been mocked by your faith and you be quiet? Don't say Merry Christmas. You might offend somebody else. Well, why can't I tell them Merry Christmas and I love them and happy whatever they celebrate? Because we're paying you and our money that we give to you will be withheld from you if you don't do what we tell you to do. Anyways, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He cursed David by his gods. He said, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? You come at me with that? Look at me. I'm trying to remind you of who I am. David's not even paying attention. 
He said, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day. I'm not even just going to take you out. I'm taking your whole camp out. You don't understand who's with me. You don't understand what I know. You don't understand who I'm in. You ain't going to have my family. You're not going to have my community. You're not going to have my country. You're not going to have my kids. You're not going to have my wife. I'm taking you and everybody with you out. It's done. I'm going to give them to the beasts of the earth. I'm going to let you go where you belong. And the entire assembly may know that the Lord does not save with the sword or the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. Some of you guys are social media evangelists. You guys are so comfortable behind a keyboard writing your thoughts and opinions until persecution comes and you're hiding the post. Like, hold on, let me delete that. Somebody's mad about it. Somebody's offended. I didn't say that the right way. It's missing context. Let me get in an argument. Why are you listening to the giant? Stand on the word of God regardless of if anybody else agrees with it or not. When the Philistine rose and came toward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag, took out the stone, and slung it, and it struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone penetrated his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Notice how the Bible says, it was just a little stick with a rope and some lambskin and a rock. And he had the victory. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in David's hand. He reminds you, there was nothing of the world in his hand. There was nothing of their strategy in his hand. It was my strategy. It was my anointing. It was my authority. And he released it in front of him before he ran into the battle. And he followed the word of God. And the word of God is what caused that stone to hit in the right spot at the right place at the right time. So he ran over and he stood over the Philistine and he grasped the Philistine's sword. And he said, this is going to be funny. I'm cutting your head off with your sword. How did he pick that sword up, by the way? I mean, the sword is probably taller than him. I mean, he probably, like, can you imagine him, like, struggling? Like, everybody's kind of watching. Like, what's he going to do? Is he trying to pick that sword up? And it just kind of falls. <laughs> this stuff was grotesque back in the day, right? The sons of Israel, oh, let's see. Um, the men of Israel and Judah stood with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the Valley of the Gates of Ekron. They fatally wounded the Philistines, and they fell along the way, even as Gath and Ekron. And the sons of Israel returned from their pursuit of the Philistines and plundered their camp. Then David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his weapons in his tent. Conclusion. When you win, everybody around you triumphs. When you win, the confidence of your camp increases, and they pursue the battle with you. When you win, you're not alone anymore. But see, who's going to be the David in your family? Who's going to be the David to come in and say, I know you're saying all that stuff, but here's what the word of the Lord says. I know you're saying you're sick and you got these symptoms. I don't deny them, but I'm not listening to them. I'm telling you what the truth is. I know you're having financial challenges. You don't know how you're going to meet your mortgage, but here's what God says about the finances. I know you're having relationship problems, and I know your marriage is a little bit rocky, but let's stop talking about what he did and she did. Let's talk about what he said. And let's come to the middle of that because a threefold cord is uneasily broken. So let's bring the word of God into the situation. Let's be the Davids of our family. How many people are ready to be the David? How many people are ready to be the David? Look, I hope that you guys were encouraged by today's message. I know that I get excited talking about it because I believe this stuff, man. I believe in the power that rises up inside of me when I deposit that word of God in me. I believe that when I start speaking it and it starts rising up in me, I get this energy. It, it's called Christian energy. It's the spiritual energy that just when you speak the truth, it releases with that power, and you don't have to do anything but lift your hands and say thank you. You just got to praise. So here's what I've been asked to do. I've been asked to, to give the increase message today. And I know a lot of times pastors are like, we don't really give an increase message. We got to we got a church that gives, and I know that to be true. It's a missions church, but I want to use a practical example of what we just learned to give the increased message. You guys got a few minutes? I want to teach a little bit on wisdom of the word of God when it comes to finances. 
Because a lot of times if we don't share what the truth says about it, maybe there's pieces of it that we miss and then it gets clouded with our understanding in the world and it gets clouded with budget planning and what this financial advisor says and what that person says and what this person says and we forget that the true wisdom is how God says to do it. Here's what I always tell people. If you want God's results, you got to do things God's way. You can try to do it your way. You're not going to get God's results. Nothing wrong with that, but you want to learn how he says to do it because then there'll be peace with it. So let's take a look at the strategy that we just used. First, got to set the vision. You know, for me, I wanted to have godly stewardship over my finances. I realized that just going and getting a paycheck or just going and working a task or just going and, and growing my business in my own power was stressful. It was, it, was, it was frustrating. And when the money came in, it wasn't always enough. In fact, sometimes it was half or less than half. Especially as I was learning to be a good steward over my finances, giants rose up all over the place. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so determine to pay your tithes within each increase that you get, no matter how scary that might be. Tithing is where it starts. There is something beyond tithing, but tithing is where it starts. So I'm going to give a little bit of a tithing message. The first thing we need to identify is the giant after we got the vision, right? I, my vision is to give 10% of my increase every paycheck. This is what we determined about, I don't know, it, it wasn't right away, I will tell you that much. First, we just kind of like gave whatever we felt comfortable with giving, so it'd be like, here's five bucks, right? And I remember being in church when I was a kid uh, and, and watching the offering plate go by and watching like dollar get thrown in there and some change get thrown in there, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's more than that, right? So mind you, whatever I share with you, it doesn't mean that if you don't do this that you're condemned, it's just this is an opportunity to go to a higher place. And it's going to require faith, especially if you're not operating on this plane. Because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That means the way he says to do it isn't necessarily going to connect with what we understand. Unless we've ascended to his way of thinking in it. And then he'll take us deeper into the knowledge of him. So identify the giant. Here was my fear. Not having enough money to meet the needs. The enemy telling me to withhold my tithe because you won't have enough to survive. You're not going to pay your bills. You're, you're going to miss. This bill isn't going to get paid on time. You're going you're to be short on your rent. You're, you're, you're not going to be able to buy your kids the food that they need. You're, you're going to starve. This was the chatterbox in my head every time I went to give my tithe. I realized that the tithe was necessary for me to access for future wisdom in the kingdom. So we had to remember when God provided for us in the un unexpected ways. We've all had a time in our life where it seemed like we weren't going to have a need met, and somehow God met that need through either a resource or money to fulfill the need. You know, a lot of times when we were in those seasons, we didn't necessarily get the money to solve the problem, but somebody would say, hey, I'm bringing you dinner tonight. And you know what the, the Lord would bring to my remembrance is faithfulness. I was scared. There was years where Jessica and I didn't eat very many meals a day because we were trying to make sure our kids got food. We were trying to build a business. We were going from one life to the next life. We were leaving the world, and we were coming into the kingdom, and we were trying to put away all the ways that we did things before, and we determined once we got that vision to do things God's way, and it was hard. I mean, the biggest struggle becomes your greatest victory. We're still on that journey, but I remembered all the times when it came to giving that tithe that I felt that check, like, mm, I don't want to do this, and then God would remind me. Hey, remember when that random check came in the mail because of that car insurance deal that happened five years ago and it paid that bill that showed up? Oh, yeah, Lord. I'm so grateful for your faithfulness. Remember, even when we're not faithful, he is faithful. So we got to pick up our staff. we got to seek out the word of God and begin to build our faith in this area. Your faith can grow. you got to grow your faith. Faith without works is dead, though. That means you got to apply what you learn. you got to apply what you're taught. you gotta, you got to put your money where your mouth is. But I say you send your mouth where you want your money to go. So select your stones. Here's a couple of scriptures that can help you out. In Proverbs it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. I believe this speaks both to material wealth and wisdom's increase in your life. Your vats, like, you, you'll be able to, to hear from me. You'll be able to see what I want you to see. You, you're, you're putting your faith in your trust in me, and I'm going to honor that. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. And here's where I get this truth in Malachi 3, 8 through 12. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. What have we robbed him of? 
But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings, separate things. We're not going to go into both of them today. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. What have we robbed him of? We robbed him of his ability to bless us. He can't bless us because we're born into something called the earth curse system. We've been taken out of the provision of the garden, and we've been put into the earth curse system where he said, by sweat and toil and struggle, we will have to labor to provide for ourselves. But then through Jesus Christ, he brought us back into the kingdom, and he gives us access constantly to the kingdom through his principles and his ways. And without applying his principles and his ways, we cannot access the kingdom. So if we want kingdom provision in our life, we've got to operate the way the kingdom teaches us to operate, the kingdom of God, that is. So we've robbed him of his ability to bless us because he has no authority to operate in our life if we haven't given him the doorway to do that by our faith. There's always a condition on the promise the pastor always says, right? He says, you've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Here's what I thought. Here's my tithe. Where's the dump truck? Beep, beep, beep. It's just going to dump money into my house. You know what I mean? And what I realized he was saying was that it's still going to be your responsibility to go harvest the resources that I have for you, but I'm going to give you the wisdom to do that. Open up the heavens and pouring out a blessing so great you can't contain is I'm going to overwhelm you with my revelation of how to acquire the things that I need for you to accomplish the things that you want. See, the tithe The tithe opened up the windows of heaven for me to receive from the word of God, the wisdom of God, to be able to operate financially in the kingdom. This is what he says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, and neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's the way that I interpret this. If I've got a field... And I'm trying to plant seed in that field. And I don't have a border around that field. Anything that is outside of that field can come in and take whatever's in the field as it starts to grow. If the field isn't properly taken care of and nourished and watered, as things start to grow in it, if those roots aren't in the right place, the fruit can fall before it's time and I won't get the harvest. See, what the Bible says is that I, I will rebuke the devourer for you through your tithe. You ever meet those people that they just constantly have financial calamity in their life? Even believers, like their car broke down and I just, this just happened. It's always these crazy things that you're like, you were getting on the right track financially and then something happened. I was getting money saved in the bank and then something happened. I was getting this and something happened. And they're not tithing 10% of their increase. What they can't see is that the enemy is coming and taking their resources and stealing their faith. They're putting their hope in their bank account and not hope in the kingdom of God to provide for their needs. So the enemy keeps devouring their, their substance. He keeps devouring their resources through circumstances, through trials, through tribulations, through bills, through random situations. You see, what I believe is a tithe protects us from a lot of those random situations from happening. Not only that, but he causes the field to be ready so that when we do give an offering, it will flourish in the right environment, that it will begin to grow and produce fruit. So bring all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And he says, test me on it. This is the one thing he says, just trust me. Put your faith in me. You know, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. They say in the financial world, wherever your money is, is where your thoughts will be. And see, if you're not putting your money into the kingdom of God, expecting the kingdom to operate, your thoughts are probably not in the kingdom of God toward your money. You're trying to make your resources meet your needs. And God's saying, if you just think on me, if you, if you put your trust and your hope and your faith in me, I will meet all of your needs and I'll stop the devourer from taking all your resources. Not only that, but I'll produce a harvest for you that you can't even understand. And that harvest will be wisdom of how to acquire the next season in your life, how to step into greater or to more. You know, we have a ton of, a ton. We did this financial class. I did three sessions on this stuff, and there were so many people that were blessed by it. Raises, bonuses, debt cancellation. I just saw so many things happen, and I'm like, okay, well, you you told me to teach them all this stuff. (laughs) Come on. Come on, all these people, there's testimony after testimony after testimony of people that said, you know what, I was tithing off of my my, my net. You mean the government got the percentage off the whole amount, but God didn't? Well, I was afraid that I wasn't going to meet my needs. Yeah, but once you tithe, what happened? Well, I got a new job, or I got a promotion, or I got a bonus, or I got, my needs were met. The debt was canceled. I didn't have to worry about it anymore. This is in the last month. 
It's because people just decided to honor the word of God with reverence. And God opened up their understanding of what to do, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it. And he gave them the resources and they handled them appropriately. So what's the sling? The sling in this situation is begin to clear over your finances in agreement with the word of God. The sling was a twofold rope and it had a strap that was made most likely of lamb's skin. And when those two were operating in cooperation with the rock, it produced power. When you release that power, it hits the target because God says, my word will not return to me void. I'm going to give you an opportunity to step out in faith today to bring your tithes into the storehouse so that there's meat in God's house. This is the part of this sermon where people are like, oh, money. Why is it such a big deal to you? Why do you think about it so much? I mean, do you think about oxygen like you think about money? No, because you got more than enough. But if I stuck your head underneath water and you started to suffocate, would you be thinking about your bank account or your oxygen? You'd be thinking about oxygen. I just want to breathe. And that's how most people feel financially. Except God says, here's how you breathe. And you say, no, Lord, I got this. I've been paying my bills all these years. Let me connect the oxygen tank so that I can breathe. It sounds silly that when you put it that way, but it's a reality of the situation. So I'd like to pray with you over your tithe. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to get in agreement with you according to the word of God. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And I'm telling you, all you got to do is find three or five of those stones and meditate on them for your faith to rise up. And as your faith rises up and as you begin to act on that faith, you begin to activate the kingdom of God in your life. And as you begin to activate the kingdom of God in your life, things will start to happen over time. The fruit will begin to be produced and it will be good. And there will be peace with it. The Bible says that God gives you the ability to create wealth without the painful toil, without the struggle. That ability comes from the wisdom of God and operating in kingdom financial perspective. Does that make sense? All right. So you can use giving through text. There's people, the ushers will give envelopes out. They can hand you the envelopes so that you can do whatever you want to do. This is your opportunity to get quiet with the Lord and to be led by his spirit, what you should do. And here's what I bind in the name of Jesus, your fear. Fear and faith cannot exist in the same place. The Bible says you should not give out of necessity and compulsion. You don't need to give because I said it. I'm just telling you the, the principle, the word of God. But if you feel compelled inside to step out in a way that you have not stepped out before to give, that's probably the spirit of God because I can't remember the last time Satan told me to give to my church. Just saying. I also think that as you give from your house, you should get in agreement with your wife. There's power and agreement. Anytime two or more gather together in the name of Jesus, I am there among them. And whenever they ask me, I, they will be done. So get a vision for your tithe and release your faith for it. Are you ready? I want to pray. All right. Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name and we give you thanks for the word that went forth today. We know that when your word is released, that that faith rise up in people, and it is now. Your Bible says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. There cannot be faith tomorrow. There cannot be faith yesterday. Your Bible says that we shouldn't worry about the things that the world worries about because tomorrow's problems will take care of itself. But when we have faith now, we need to release our faith now. And so I pray over these tithes, I pray over the giving, I pray over these offerings, and I declare by the name of Jesus that there will be a 30, a 60, and a 100-fold return on each and every single seed that is sown today. Lord, I declare miracles and miraculous signs and wonders confirming your word preached. I declare that these Davids will get a revelation of the kingdom of God, and we know that one experience with the kingdom of God, we will never be the same again. So Lord, I ask that those that are delivering this tithe to you, that belongs to you, the 10% of their increase that is yours, that we will not rob it from you any longer. We will not be afraid of your principles in your kingdom. We will put our faith and our hope and trust in you. We will remember your faithfulness. And as we give, we know that it will be given unto us, pressed down, shaken together. Shall it be running over as men give unto our bosom. We thank you that the wisdom from the kingdom of heaven is overflowing in our hearts and our minds and giving us wisdom of what to do this week. And I declare miracles over these resources and over these finances. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, God bless y'all. Here's the great news. Pastor should be back next week. <laughs> Pastor should be back next week. I appreciate your guys' time and attention. I give all glory to God, and I give you thanks for it. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and may you be blessed this week as you head into your life, hopefully not the same as you came in.